Thank you, Mark. So just look around and you'll see what I see. Every is good. Everybody was enjoying themselves. I left too early though. Elizabeth did the zip line and I didn't get to see that, but uh, she's braver than I am. But it was a really great retreat. And um, so they'll do it next year. You all consider that. Make this crowd even smaller next year for me. Well, we are continuing our studies in Jeremiah, and you probably, if you've noticed from the bulletin, it's chapters 21 through chapter 23, verse 8. I'm not preaching all of those chapters. I'm going to take really the first two, chapters 21 and 22, briefly as sort of uh, setting up what we're going to consider with most of our time in chapter 23. And that's what I'm going to read from, chapter 23, verses 1 through 8, a great prophecy of the future. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and you have not attended to them, behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their pasture, and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up the shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will... Not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I had driven them. Then they will live on their own soil. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time of studying it together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. In 1982, Ronald Reagan gave a speech to the British House of Commons where he predicted that freedom and democracy will leave Marxism and Leninism on the ash heap of history. On reflection, it might seem that he was prescient, that he was uh, being prophetic, but really that's where all isms and human systems end up. That's even where nations, all of them, end up. Visit Athens today or Rome. The tourist sites are ruins of once great nations. So to borrow his phrase, every nation has ended up or will end up on the ash heap of history. Think of them, if, if you can, scores of them from the Egyptian empires, and there were more than one, there's more than one Brit, uh, Egyptian empire, but trace them all through to the British Empire, they're all gone. There's one exception. It will be rescued from the ash heap. And that's the message of Jeremiah 23, where the prophecy is of a righteous branch who will reign as king and act wisely. It is a prophecy of a glorious age to come for the Jewish nation when its Messiah will do justice and righteousness in the land. What land is that? The land of Israel. Now you wouldn't think that would happen from reading the two chapters that precede. 
like so many of the early chapters of Jeremiah, they are about judgment on Judah for repeated sin. But all of that is really background for this great prophecy and a contrast that that ultimately helps clarify and magnify the grace and the glory revealed in chapter 23, and that will be in the age to come. A king was to be righteous, and a king was to establish justice in the land. Instruction on that was given in the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, the king, when he came to the throne, was to write out the book of Deuteronomy and reflect upon it. The kings of the land failed to do that. But days are coming when there will be a perfect king who will bring justice, peace, and glory. That's the prophecy. And while it's not about the church, it does apply to us today as we will see. This is one of the great messianic passages of the Bible, but it all begins with a denunciation of the monarchy for its failure. There are four condemned kings, the kings that Jeremiah knew. They followed Josiah, who was the last righteous king of Judah. He had led the nation in a great reform, but he was killed by the Egyptians at the Battle of Megiddo in 609 B.C. And upon his death... Jehoahaz, his fourth son, came to the throne. But Pharaoh Necho deposed him almost immediately and took him down to Egypt in chains. He was succeeded by his older brother, Jehoiakim, who was placed on the throne by Pharaoh. He was a vassal, he was a slave of Egypt, and he was a wicked king. He forgot the reforms his father, Josiah, had brought about in The nation reverted to idolatry. In fact, under Jehoiakim, they even adopted the worship of the Egyptian gods. After the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians, Nebuchadnezzar took him to Babylon in chains, but he died on the way at the age of 36. The Babylonians then appointed Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin, to be king, His reign was evil as well, and very brief. He reigned for three months and ten days. He was 18 years old when Nebuchadnezzar carried him off to Babylon along with 10,000 Jews. He was succeeded by his uncle, Zedekiah, who was also appointed by the Babylonians to rule in his place. Chapter 21 begins during the last days of Zedekiah's reign with Zedekiah seeking at this time a word from the Lord. He had broken a pledge to the Babylonians. He had done a very foolish thing, as he discovered. He revolted. Well, that infuriated the Babylonians, of course, and they laid siege to Jerusalem, and Zedekiah was worried about his fate. Would it be like that of the others? So he sent two priests to Jeremiah to inquire of the Lord for him. And in doing that, we might think, well, that was a righteous response to a crisis. The Lord had brought him to his senses. And and as as a wise man, he's appealing to the Lord for help and response. But this wasn't a righteous response at all. Zedekiah was a weak man. We'll see him later in our studies. A feckless king who rebelled not only against the Babylonians, but fundamentally he rebelled against God. And then he looked to God to rescue him. But like many people, he wasn't repentant. There was no real change in his way, not truly as we have studied in the past, turn to the Lord. So he seeks a word from the Lord about his situation, and the news came back, it was not good. Jeremiah sent word that God was against Judah and was against him, was against Zedekiah the king. Verse 5, I myself will make war against you with an outstretched hand and a mighty arm. Now that's a terrifying word to receive from the Lord God. What he was saying is he brought down the Babylonians upon the nation against Jerusalem. He brought them down for punishment. 
the faithless city would be destroyed. And he says in verse 7 that Zedekiah and the people would be given into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. So Judah was doomed. But God was still merciful. He gave a choice to the people. In verse 8 he says, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. The people could remain in the city, they could fight and die. That was a certainty if they did. Or they could surrender and live. In the ancient Near East, armies practiced total war. When they defeated the city, they destroyed it and they slaughtered the people. Some of the ancient kings wrote about this, wrote some gruesome reports of the aftermath of victory and boasted of things like heads piled up like pyramids. The only way a city was saved was by surrender. This is the meaning of the statement in verse 9, he who goes out will have his own life as booty. He'll save his life by surrendering. Now that sounds like treason, doesn't it? It certainly sounded like treason to the people. They didn't like that. But resistance was bad because God was against Judah. He was punishing the nation, and surrender was actually obedience to God. He's given instruction. He said to them, surrender. You're under discipline. You've been disobedient, and judgment is coming. But he's giving them a way of saving themselves by surrendering, and doing that was actually yielding to God's will and undergoing his discipline. It was obedience. So, in what appears to be a last-ditch appeal to the king in verses 11 through 14. Jeremiah tells him to do good, to administer justice every morning. Again, it fell on deaf ears. And the chapter ends with the Lord promising judgment. Behold, I am against you, he said. And then verse 15 has this ominous description of the what he would do. He would turn the land into a forest fire. Still, in chapter 22, the Lord sends Jeremiah back to the king's house to remind him of his responsibility, which was justice, protecting the weaker parts of society. And Jeremiah went and reminded Zedekiah of his duties. Verse 3, do justice and righteousness and deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of the oppressor. The Lord has great concern for the poor and needy. In the book of Deuteronomy, the book that the king was to copy, and the book that the king was to study, in that book there is emphasis placed on helping widows and orphans and strangers. The king was to protect the weak, and enforce the laws of the covenant. When Josiah did that, the righteous king, the last righteous king in the land, when he did that, things went well for the nation. God blessed the nation. But his successors didn't do that. The poor and the weak were exploited. He urged Zedekiah to repent and do what is right, but again, he didn't. The rest of the chapter recounts the failures of the other three kings to show that judgment was deserved. Judgment would be hard, but judgment was deserved. God's judgment is always righteous. It's always perfect. We may question it. We're wrong to do that. God always acts in complete and perfect righteousness. So the rest of chapter 22 is about that. It's about judgment. It also shows that the Lord is patient. He gives people opportunity to repent, but they prove unwilling. Those people did. Zedekiah and the kings of Judah are examples of that very thing. Well, what is clear from this and from all of Scripture is that the Lord God is absolutely sovereign in judgment as well as in blessing. Over in Babylon at this time, Daniel was there, a captive, but exalted to service in Nebuchadnezzar's court. And there in chapter 2 and verse 21, 
he prays. And there's this specific aspect of his prayer that is striking to me. He prayed, he, speaking of the Lord God, he removes kings and establishes kings. He's done that from the beginning of time. He does it today. He'll do that to the end. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He is sovereign, absolutely sovereign. Still, man is responsible for what happens. Spurgeon stated it well. We hold tenaciously that salvation is all of grace, but we also believe with equal firmness that the ruin of man is entirely the result of his own sin. It is the will of God that saves. It is the will of man that damns. That's true. We hold the two together. God elects. His election is sovereign and free. His election is totally unconditional. It has nothing to do with, with what we do. It's what He chooses. We believe in election. We believe in God's predestination. He's a sovereign God. He knows the end from the beginning. He works all things according to the counsel of His will, Ephesians 1.11. And yet with Paul, we say to the sinner, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Jeremiah did that. Zedekiah refused. So things would not go well for Judah. The great house of David would end. And like all other nations, Israel would be left on the ash heap of history. Then we come to chapter 23. And out of the gloom and doom of chapters 21 and 22 we read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. It's a prophecy of the Messiah, of the reign of Christ. Those days are coming, says the Lord. Before that bright revelation is given, however, more judgment is prophesied. This time it's on shepherds. Jeremiah has a word of woe for the shepherds. That's how chapter 23 begins. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. The close connection between verse 1 of chapter 23 and the previous two chapters would indicate that these shepherds are the kings. And I think they are. I think that's who he's directly addressing. But it's not just them. Because Jeremiah also speaks of prophets later. And he speaks of priests. It is all uh, of those who had responsibility for the welfare of the people. Responsibility uh, politically in, in terms of their material care as well as their spiritual care care for the people in all aspects. And with few exceptions, these, these shepherds were not caring for the Lord's sheep, the sheep of His pasture. They, in fact, were destroying and scattering them. The kings led the people into false worship. They led the people into Baal worship. But also in verse 11, Jeremiah says, both prophet and priest are polluted. All through the chapter, he denounces them as prophesying falsely. In verse 32, God speaks and says, They led my people astray by their falsehoods and reckless boasting. And then he adds, Yet I did not send them. Frequently read that. The Lord would say, speak of these, speak of these false prophets and say, I didn't send them. They deprived the people of truth and they led them astray. And so here at the beginning of the chapter, the Lord says they are destroying and scattering the sheep. In Hosea 4, verse 6, God said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That, that is a verse that we ought to memorize. Simple verse, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is essential. We want to... We want to advance the importance of other things and sometimes disparage knowledge. Knowledge is critical. Knowledge is essential. 
wherever spiritual truth is withheld, spiritual weakness and death follow. It, it was the same during the Lord's ministry. He felt compassion for the multitudes coming to him. And in, in Matthew chapter 9, he, he expresses that. And, and it said that he felt this compassion because they, looking at these multitudes, were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. For decades and generations, really, they had been without true shepherds. Well, it's true today as well. When people are deprived of God's Word, when a church moves away from the honest exposition of Scripture, teaching the Bible, that church will decline and die. That happened in Judah and Israel. And the Lord promises action. He promises judgment on those false, unfaithful shepherds. Verse 2, Therefore says the Lord God of Israel concerning the shepherds who are tending my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not attended to them. Behold, I am about to attend to you for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. That had already happened in the north. The Assyrians had swept away the ten tribes of Israel. Now in Jeremiah's day, the Babylonians would destroy the southern kingdom of Judah. So again, more spiritual failure, more disobedience, more judgment. But that is not the end. In the midst of all the gloom and doom, there is hope. God's not finished with His people Israel. He cannot utterly, finally, be finished with them, cast them off. He promises He will gather a remnant, His flock, out of all the nations where they had been scattered in judgment, and they will have good shepherds. That's the promise of verses 3 and 4. And He says, they will be fruitful and multiply. Sheep thrive in good pastures where good shepherds lead them. And God's sheep grow in His pastures on His truth. As a result, He said, they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing. Now, that is a prophecy. It looks forward to a, a time after Jeremiah. But to what time? That's the question. Some interpret this as having a, a double fulfillment, first under Cyrus in the 6th century B.C., and then with the coming of Jesus Christ, who is the Good Shepherd. And so the remnant that is gathered from all the nations is first those who return from Babylon and Persia under Zerubbabel and Ezra. And then it is all those who are now being called out of the world through the preaching of the gospel from the day of Pentecost to the present. Jews, but largely Gentiles. The prophecy, though, indicates something different. Gentiles saved out of the, the countries, the nations today, weren't dri driven there in judgment. Israel was. This is about that. This is about the Jews. That's the context. I think that's a clear context. The Lord will bring back Jeremiah's countrymen from the lands where they were driven. And since it is a worldwide return, this can't be just the remnant of the 6th century B.C. But the rest of the passage in verses 5 through 8, also gives details that, that clearly go beyond the 6th century and this gospel age so that the prophecy can't be spiritualized into some present fulfillment. Verses 5 and 6, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. The prophecy is about a king. 
who will reign wisely and justly. When the remnant returned under Cyrus, Persia ruled them. And since Jeremiah and Zedekiah, the Jews have had no king. Zedekiah was the last of them. This people will have a king, and he will rule over Judah and Israel. In verse 8, they are referred to as the descendants of the household of Israel. It's hard to see how it could be made clearer that these people are ethnic Israelites. They are Jews. They're not Gentile converts. This is future. It's not present day salvation. Further, the, the scene for this blessing is the land, which is defined even more specifically and literally in verse 8 as their own soil which from the context must be the land of Israel. Now, I can't think of him, I can't think of how he could have put it more clearly that this is going to happen in the land of Israel than saying your own soil, that the dirt under your feet is going to be the place that all this will take place. Both Judah and Israel will dwell together in the land with their own soil. Saved and securely in the land. Those are the two words that are used. Saved and securely. That's the prophecy. But it's never happened. Under Ezra and Nehemiah, the remnant was continually under threat while they rebuilt the temple and the walls of Jerusalem. Later, they fought the Greeks during the time of the Maccabees. Then, of course, they came under Roman rule. The Jews rebelled against that in A.D. 66 and were again scattered to the four corners of the earth. Another nation, it seems, on the ash heap of history. The nation has never dwelt securely in the land. And the northern and southern kingdoms, Israel and Judah, have never been united. How could they be reunited at this time at least? Certainly, Israel, the ten tribes of the north, were gone 100 years earlier. All this is to say that this is still unfulfilled prophecy. It looks to the future and is the, the promise of the millennial kingdom when Christ will rule on the earth from Jerusalem. He is called a righteous branch who is raised up for David. That is a, an unusual title, a branch. It's not original with Jeremiah. Actually, Isaiah also refers to the Messiah as the branch. In Isaiah 4, verse 2, he wrote, The branch of the Lord will be beautiful, and he will make the land beautiful. He'll make it fruitful, which is to say he will be the adornment of the survivors of Israel. That's what Isaiah said. Now, living branch bears fruit, and this branch will make the land and the people fruitful. It is all the product of God's grace. It will be a, a glorious age. It will be a future age. Nothing like this has ever happened. In Isaiah 11 and verse 1, he said, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. It's a way of of saying, this ruler is a descendant of David, and so the rightful king of Israel. As I was reflecting on something that Mike said yesterday, this passage came to mind, what Isaiah is saying, what Jeremiah says, where he is spoken of a, as a shoot, a branch uh, from this, st this stump of a tree, is what he's describing. And it's a way of saying he is the human descendant of David and the rightful heir to the throne. But I thought, because Mike referred to John chapter 15 of Christ saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. It's kind of the opposite thing. Well, in, Isaiah, in, in John 15, he's describing his eternal nature. He's the God-man, and they're in him. He's the source of all blessing. We've become fruitful because we're in Him. He gives us faith and obedience and all the fruit. That's because of His deity and who He is. 
Here it's his humanity that's spoken of and it's traced to the throne of David. And that's the point that the prophets are making, that this is the rightful king of Israel. But also he's from the stem or stock, like the stump of a tree that has been, been cut down because that was the condition of the house of, of David. It seemed to be finished by Babylon. Jeremiah carried on the, that same image describing Christ as a branch or a shoot because like a shoot that sprouts from a fallen tree, he would come from a fallen dynasty. You've probably seen around your neighborhood what I've seen with this storm we had about three months ago, these trees that were toppled. And now you see with some of them where the, 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 the trunk remains as one tree up the street. They didn't chop the thing down. They've got this trunk, but now shoots are coming out. That's the picture here. Uh, he would come out of a fallen dynasty. When it seems the house of David was gone and a, a thing of the past, this shoot or branch will appear. It's alive and fruitful. The kings of Israel were spiritually dead and unfaithful, but he is just the opposite. He is faithful. He will reign as king, Jeremiah says, and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. He is the fulfillment of all that a king and a shepherd was to be. He is the good shepherd. This is a, a prophecy of hope. It was given during the darkest days of the nation. Judgment was promised. The Babylonians were coming. They're described back, you remember, in chapter 4 as, a, as evil from the north. And then in verse 7, uh, uh, Jeremiah prophesies, a lion has gone out from his thicket and a destroyer of nations has set out. And this great army would lay waste to Judah and Jerusalem. But then there's Isaiah's prophecy of the branch taken up a hundred years later by Jeremiah, a reminder that God's word is alive. Time doesn't change things. A hundred years have passed. Thousands of years have passed. That's still true. It's still a real prophecy that, that time cannot change and will occur. Why? Because God cannot forsake his people. That's the nature of the Lord. That's Hosea 11.8. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? He can't. His affection for his people, his chosen people, is too strong to do that, and his promises can't allow him to do that. There is a future for Israel. That's what Paul describes in Romans 11 and verse 26 when he says, and so all Israel will be saved. Today, to go back to Romans 11, they are the natural branches that have been broken off of the olive tree of blessing. But in the future, they will be grafted back into the tree for, Paul said, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The promises have been made, they cannot be broken. Praise God for that. Praise God that His word and His promises are irrevocable. Otherwise, we might be rejected and cast off. If the elect can be cast off, if Israel can be cast off, then we can be cast off. But that can never happen. <coughs> Divine election is irrevocable. Didn't depend upon you to begin with. You can't unelect yourself. That's all God's sovereign grace, and He will not do that. And we see that with Israel. Gifts and the calling are irrevocable. Divine election is irreversible. The promise that is given to us is sure. Paul said in Romans 11, the church has been put in that olive tree of blessing. Wild branches, that's what the Gentile believers are. That's what Christians are. Wild branches have been grafted into this olive tree of blessing. We haven't replaced Israel. We've been joined to Israel and its promises. And so its future is our future, and that future is certain. God has promised. This, as I said at the beginning, is about Israel and the future, but it applies to us because Israel's future is the future of the church as well. 
it's the future of the world as well. We are in the olive tree of Romans 11. We have a glorious hope. It is the age of the resurrection, of the glory to come, uh, of a world without end. That's our hope, that's our future, and that's the application of this to ourselves. But the, the, the passage applies to us in other ways as well, most obviously with this warning to the shepherds who scatter the sheep of the Lord's pasture. There have always been so-called shepherds who don't feed God's sheep, but eat them instead. They were in Israel. That's what Jeremiah was speaking of. But they're in the church as well. Jesus warned of false prophets who were wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul warned the elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, to guard the sheep against wolves that would ravage the flock. False shepherds are wolves. They use the sheep. They abuse them. And you read through the New Testament and you see various ways in which they do that. They fleece them financially or they take advantage of them morally. But chiefly, it seems to me, the bad shepherd doesn't point the sheep to the good shepherd. That's our mission. Our mission is to preach Christ Jesus and Him crucified. Proclaim Him as He is revealed in the Bible as the eternal Son of God, the Savior of men, and the one who will rule this earth in the days to come. Rule the entire universe as He is doing. That's how you can tell a true shepherd from a false one. How does he preach Christ? Because the Word of God is about Him. Jesus Christ is the key to the Scriptures, which is the nourishment of our souls. That's an important application of this passage to ourselves. Be on guard. But again, this portion of Jeremiah is principally about our future. It reminds us that, that history is not aimless. History is not meaningless. It was for the Gentiles. The Greeks had this view, I've, I've told you this before, but that history is cyclical. It's just going round and round. Things repeat themselves. But it's not going anywhere. Whereas you read the Bible, it's going somewhere. It's linear. It's headed in a specific direction. Things are moving toward a glorious conclusion when Christ returns and reigns. In contrast to all of the kings of Israel, even the good ones, take David, take Solomon. David failed miserably. Solomon failed at the end of his life. The wisest man to ever live lived like, a, like an absolute fool by the time he died. The best of them had flaws. This king has no flaws. He is holy and full of grace. He will come again. Days are coming, the Lord said. He will gather his people from all of the countries and establish the kingdom and reign in righteousness. Already one of the amazing events of modern times is the establishment of the state of Israel in 1948. In 1956, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, had an interview with Edward R. Murrow. I remember him. Some of you are old enough to remember watching him on television on a you know, Friday night, the different people he'd interview. Well, he interviewed Ben-Gurion, and he spoke of the rise and the survival of tiny Israel in an Arab sea. Ben-Gurion said, in Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. Well, that's more true than even Ben-Gurion knew. Providence was in it. Now, I don't think that the state of Israel today is a fulfillment of prophecy. But neither do I think it's insignificant. In fact, it may well be God's preparation for fulfillment. But here's the point. If miracles explain what has occurred in modern Israel, what will occur, as stated here in Jeremiah 23, is absolutely supernatural with Christ's return on the clouds to judge the world. 
He will establish the kingdom promised to David and to Israel, a kingdom of peace and glory. That, as I said, is the goal of history. The kingdom will not come by our work of evangelism. We're not bringing in the kingdom by giving the gospel. It certainly will not come by our politics. Mankind cannot establish the kingdom of God. Only Christ can and will do that. It is miraculous. It's supernatural. As I said, he will do it. That is a certainty because God promised it. It's prophesied here. And God is good for his word. His promises are reliable. They cannot fail. Not one promise that you have and that's made in the Bible can fail. We have this hope, and we have it with certainty. And we're to live with that hope. That's the practical aspect of all of this. Not just an interesting thing to study. It gives us hope in this world. This, this world is passing away. This world that we live in now is a fallen world. It is doomed to the ash heap of history. Our hope is in the world to come. And we're to live wisely now in this world, in the present, which is an investment in the world to come. Our future is eternal. Our future is glorious. The righteous branch is coming in God's time. He will reign. The whole world will be just, peaceful, fruitful, and glorious. Is your future there? It is if you put your faith in Christ. His name, Jeremiah said, is the Lord our righteousness. Now, how is he our righteousness? Well, we sang about that in our second hymn this morning. His robes for mine. Oh, wonderful exchange. That's what's happened. Through his sacrifice on the cross, our sin was punished. And he gained righteousness for all who join themselves to him through faith and faith alone. At that moment, his perfection is imputed to us. It's put to our account. It's as though we exchange robes, our filthy robes for his righteous and pure white robes. It's an alien righteousness. That is, it's his righteousness, not ours. It's not something that we've done. It's what he's done. In that way, we're justified. We are forgiven forever, we're put right with God, and gifted with eternal life. It's all of grace. God sets before you, as he set before Judah, the way of life and the way of death. Choose life. If you've not believed, we, with the Apostle Paul, beg you. On behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. May God help you to do that. Let's end with another hymn out of the Songs of Praise book. Hymn number nine, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Hymn number nine in the Songs of Praise book. Let's stand and then remain standing for the benediction. Father, we thank you for that great hope based upon the sacrifice of your son, that he's coming again, resurrected and in power, and we too will share in that same resurrection life. We thank you for him and for his death for us and for the glorious future you've given us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.